Welcome to episode 48 of the series about security podcast for July 16th, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined again by Keith Watson and Mike Hill. And uh, Keith has the first article this week. So uh, we're going to talk about Android because we kind of love Android and its various vulnerabilities. And this one is going around by the title of Vulnerability with the Android Master Key. And that is probably the worst title known to man because that's not actually the issue at all. The issue lies in the way the verification of files in the application package archives are verified. And normally there's a meta info file which lists all the files in the archive and the checksums associated with each file. So when they're installed, they can be validated to make sure they installed correctly and that they're not malicious. But it doesn't necessarily check very well because you can actually insert additional files into the zip formatted archive file. And the check will verify the signature of the first file in the archive. And if you created a second file with the same name, it would actually install the second file, or at least overwrite the first file that was installed with the second file. So this is a, a little bit of a bug in, in the way the unzipping utility works. And what you can do is you can take a perfectly good signed application package archive file and assert additional malicious files in that archive. And it will check that the checksum is correct for the first file, which is the legitimate one, and then override it with the second one, which is the illegitimate file. Um, unfortunately, it's been going around with this Android master key title on it, and there's really not a key involved unless you consider that key like key to exploiting the system or something. I'm not quite sure the name other than a uh, way to grab publicity. So. Talk a little bit about this one. Yeah, well, you know, I don't see this as a, a real major concern. Um, Google's already released a, a fix for it. Um, I think the biggest issue here is, you know, you'll have to wait to get a firmware update. And depending upon your carrier, where you got your phone, your device, you may not get that update. Uh, but I think to stay on the safe side, if you're using the Google Play Store to download your apps, you're probably like 99% safe. Google's aware of this, they fixed it, and you can bet that they're going to be aggressive in monitoring the store. I mean, they know about this vulnerability now. As they check apps in, I, don't, I think they're going to be checking for this. Well, any app they check in is going to get signed first, so they're, they're going to recreate the package archive, I assume. Or at least verify it, like you said, go back and yeah. validate it. So I think if you're using the standard Google Play Store or other trusted stores where that, I don't know who that would be. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> Amazon. Amazon. Uh, that might be the other one. Uh, you know, you're probably okay. It's when you start side loading stuff or, or using uh, other application storefronts that you may get into trouble because you don't know how well they verify what's going into their store. Right. Well, I use an Android. In fact, this is an Android. And I'm not too concerned. So, um, I, I use well, your the, lack of concern is reassuring. <laughs> well, I use the Google Play Store and the Amazon Store. I use both of them, um, and I also do sideload some a few applications from places that don't use the stores um, to to put their applications That'd online. But you know, I get them from their official area on their site. I don't get them from. Other, I don't get them in my email, or I don't download them from untrusted sources. I get them from their from their site, and I know where to go to get them. And you know, I, I I trust I trust the the few the few that I do do that with. I, I trust the the sources enough to install them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this one uh, PR wise, like you said, Keith, the title really is just kind of going for the publicity. Um, I think the, who, whatever developer worked on this zip, unzipping software just didn't consider this scenario. And, and it can be difficult at times to consider all scenarios that that may occur. It's, a, it's a kind of clever, but when you, once it's revealed, it's like, oh, yeah, that's not that hard to try. But um, you know, if your assumption was that you're only going to have one version of each file in that, then you could see where 
it would have worked as expected. So I don't think it was hard for them to fix. You know, I think it was just an oversight. Um, so you know, I think you can continue to use your Android devices. That, at least if you're using the official stores, if you, if you want to look dangerously, you know, uh, do like Preston, and, <laughs> do like Preston, and do some side loading. But you know, I think you know, just you know, teasing aside, if you trust the source, you know, it's all about trust in, in this business. I think so. I think the exploit is quite clever. I mean, yeah. to go into a little bit of detail, the, 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 an APK, the, the, uh, the Android package file, is uh, basically a zipped file. And uh, it has a bunch of files within it. And uh, the zip uh, uh, protocol, I guess, allows for uh, multiple files with the same name to be in an archive. Generally, when you use a zip utility, the zip utility will not allow that just because on disk you can't have two files with the same name. So in general, it doesn't happen. But uh, the exploit essentially put multiple files with the same name into the archive, and uh, the the, uh, the thing that checks the signatures checks the first file. And when uh, the, the APK is installed, it installs the last file. Because my, my guess is because it installs the first and then the second one's the same name, it overwrites it. Right. So, so the exploit essentially just puts a duplicate file with the same name as the previous one in there, that is the malicious file. Um, and the signature check passes, but the, the malicious file ultimately gets installed. Yeah, it looks like it used a, a slightly different path for each version of the duplicate file. I think that's how it was able to get them all in there. Because if it was at the same path, you could only have one in that zip. Well, most likely they went in and, and took the existing archive file and then appended to it yeah. using a utility to use the utility. To add it, it, it appears that the, the Android actually Android system uses the Java unzipping library, which probably is where the bug lies. <laughs> which is not surprising. It is Java, but uh, that that probably has the issue here because they're just using what was already in Java, which was the unzip or zip library to extract these things. Uh, so I think that's really where the problem lies. Now, that, if that's true, then, then the question becomes, is that a problem in the, in the JDK? So is the Java development kit actually the one where the flaw lies? Or is it just the implementation of it that uh, Google uses? Because they did it, if I believe, clean room and version. They just use the API and then, and then uh, build their own implementation. Uh, I believe that was what the old Oracle uh, lawsuit was about. So uh, it seems like that's a, a goof they made in the, in the implementation of the unzip yeah. or zip well, library. Well, one thing I would like to comment on as we probably get ready to transition to our, to our next story is that, at least in this case, Blue Box uh, responsibly discloses to Google first. Um, before I think they made their you know, PR pitch on how they discovered this fall. They did uh, disclose it to Google privately and gave them the opportunity to, to get a fix in place. Um, so I mean, that's, that's good at least, even though I think they were probably wanting some publicity from it. And, and that, nothing wrong with that. They sort of earned that you know, by discovering it. Um, at least they took the responsible path and said, here's what's going on. Here's how we exploited this. and." You know, you guys need to fix this. <laughs> uh, they they also exploited the choice of naming the problem in a way that <laughs> yeah. ensured they would get some publicity. Well, you know, I don't know. It does not say in the article whether Google rewarded them for their efforts. So I guess they're trying to, you know, <laughs> get get what they can out of their discovery. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well. I I will move on to the second article, which is mine. And this is an article, and it was in the New York Times, and it talks about the booming business of, uh, of uh, zero-day vulnerabilities. Um, and it, it, it mentions in the article that uh, the average attack on uh, persists for almost a year before it's detected. That's according to Semantic. Um, and obviously, they are could be a little bit biased because they do make security software. So, you know, a little bit take some of that grain of salt. But um, the article goes into essentially how 10 years ago hackers would, would just hand you the knowledge of the vulnerabilities over for a free t-shirt. 
And now that there's a lot more money in it, there there's a lot of avenues they can go for selling these vulnerabilities. Um, they can report them to Google or Microsoft or whoever the vulnerability is with. But there's also these other companies. One of them is called Lupin. I think that's how it's, is that how it's pronounced, Keith? <laughs> Lupin. Lupin. Which, which uh, s essentially sells these vulnerabilities to governments. And that's their customers, governments. And uh, they charge, Lupin uh, specifically charges um, an annual $100,000 subscription fee just to look at this catalog of vulnerabilities for governments. And uh, they, they, according to their website, they only sell to governments that are essentially good guys. They only sell to good guy governments, supposedly. Well, it's <laughs> debatable who those might be, probably. Right. Well, they, they, like, you have to be on certain, you know, good guy lists. <laughs> not on bad guy list. Not on bad guy list. Yeah. But who, who defines that list? So, <laughs> I thought this was interesting, um, and this this uh, could uh, be potentially where the vulnerabilities that Stuxnet, Stuxnet uh, exploited, uh, where the, where those came from, and uh, and I wanted to talk to, about this from kind of an ethical standpoint. Um, the ethics of doing this. I mean, we're all, all three of us here are CISSPs, and, and, and kind of part of the CISSP is we have a code of ethics that we're, we're expected to follow. I mean, the enforcement of that is questionable. I don't, I don't know, that's a different debate. So yeah. That's a different debate. But, but I mean, how, how ethical is this to essentially sell these uh, vulnerabilities to a government who pretty much know what they're going to be using them? I mean, I don't think there's any any question that they're not going to be necessarily using them for good. Although that's also debatable. Depending on how you I, think of it. Yes, it, there's some question as to how these are used. I I did talk to a, a U.S. defense contractor one time, and he was in the software and security business. And I asked him if if his company was involved in in buying exploits or developing them, and he said both. They both have, they have a team that actually looks for exploits, or vulnerabilities, I should say, and then creates exploits, uh, to put in their catalog. They also went out onto the market to these guys, the various little guys, and bought them from them as well. And my understanding, the way he described it, was if they have a large enough catalog, that kind of ensures a government contract with, the, specifically the U.S. government in this case, to make that catalog available to the government. And so by having a larger catalog than another defense contractor's catalog of exploits, it was more likely that you would get, you know, you'd win the bid for that sort of thing. So they were in the business of collecting uh, a lot of vulnerabilities. I don't know if that's a viable business right now. It probably is, but uh, down the road, I don't know how well that'll work. Because uh, as you pointed out, a lot of these smaller in, you know, individuals, hackers, whatever you want to use as a term, would give them to the original vendor. The vendor would then make a patch. And then that has now become a new economy. And we're now trading in vulnerabilities. And the, those that are affected by it are not just other governments. It's individual citizens. It's companies trying to do business. So then, as you, goes, as you point out, there's an ethical concern here. You're not attacking governments, but you're really, you, you have the, the weapon, if you will, to attack anybody with a, a device, an account. Right. Well, so, the idea is that as long as these, these vulnerabilities are viable for the government to purchase, they can be used to exploit individuals as well. Because as okay. soon as individuals are saved, the government probably will not be able to use them as they would like. Well, there, there's a, in some respects, they're of limited value. Okay, and okay. we're back. <laughs> That's our network connection. <laughs> so Keith can continue where he no, left if he remembers what he was. I think about. I was talking more about uh, the having a large number of exploits and vulnerabilities under your arsenal kind of like a arms arms race. Race. kind of like an arms race in terms of what we had in the past with the Cold War where it was nuclear weapons. Yes. Uh, so 
we kind of maybe learned from the Cold War, although it dragged on much longer than it probably should have. I don't know how quickly we'll learn from this this type of weapon. Well, this is this is kind of I mean, when you think of the Cold War, war this is more about buying the scientists, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's all like, part of, this of is, building your arsenal. Right. Well, the, the problem right. the problem here that, that I see is, um, you know, ten years ago. There really was no market so much. I mean, you could just disclose. A lot of times, programmers that found flaws or hackers that found flaws would just hand them over for free. And then, over time, st I think Stuxnet really helped elevate this. It's like there's a big market out there now. And now you've got vendors like Microsoft and Google and Facebook that say, we'll pay. But you could get, you know, you can get what, up to 150000 from Microsoft if you discover and give them a solution. You might be able to make ten times that from a government. And if it's all legal, if it's all legal the same, what do you tell a 21-year-old hacker? You know, I, I know what I would do now, now that I have a CISSP, I'm, I'm older, you know, I've got a family, I'd say, you know, I want to do the ethical thing. When you're 21, and I'm not picking on anyone that's 21 or younger, but when you don't have anything and someone says, well, here's a million dollars for this exploit you've written, it's like, oh, well, hey. <laughs> You know, yeah, I, that's uh, well, that yeah, could be a good lot work. Of money. It's good work if you can get it. Yeah, and, and that, and as long as that market persists, I think there's going to be a challenge. It's not like you said; it's not regulated. It, it's it's a gray line. Is it legal? Is it not legal? Is it ethical? Is it not ethical? But one, but one thing, but one thing to think about. I mean, we're we're talking about uh, the difference between getting a lot of money and, and less money. Yeah. But Google and Microsoft, they actually market their program. Right. Well, is these other right kind of don't right. market it as well. So I think what maybe they're thinking is we get more people, you know, more monkeys in a room. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll find them before these the, these other people do, you know. Yeah, but gotta, but you know, the, I think the the other side of that argument is we're gonna, you know they're try they're probably trying to get the. The brightest monkeys. It's like not that I'm calling monkeys. security researchers monkeys. <laughs> exactly, but but they're probably <laughs> trying to say we, we don't know that they're not targeting specific ones. That in that community, as people work their way up, that the governments aren't that this whatever group this is that's building up this catalog doesn't reach out and say, hey, you know, we, we saw what you sent to Google, and you know, we would have given you three times as much. Next time you uncover something, you know, give me a call. And we can talk. Sure. I, I, you know, if, if that's happening, Absolutely. you know, that there, you know, there, there's only so many people that can do these things and do them right. right. And that, to me, is the tug of war. Is you know, where do they go? I mean, does Google have to amp it up? Do they have to increase how much they pay? Uh, can they compete with governments? I, I don't know. Governments seem like they have a lot of resources they can use. You know, if, if they want to actively go after somebody. <clears throat> but back to my original <laughs> question: Is it ethical? I mean, would you, you consider this ethical to even sell these to I, this party who's going to end you, up selling them to a government? If you subscribe to the ISC Squared Code of Ethics, as an example, it talks specifically about protecting the community. Although the exact words I don't recall. Right. right. But it's about protecting the greater community, and I see that as worldwide community. Mm -hmm. And so, if you follow those, that ethical standard, then no, I don't believe it is. But uh, again, a lot of these companies don't subscribe to that level of, of ethical standard. Um, even though they are they might be U.S. companies, they might have certain laws that they need to abide by. If their buyer is the United States government, then it's whatever the United States government says. It's okay. Yeah. I was going to say, if you're a U.S. citizen and it's the U.S. government that wants to purchase it, is it ethical? Or, you know, I mean, well, the fact of the matter is, you're still leaving a vulnerability exploitable. Exploitable. I mean, yeah. If you sell yeah. it to these companies, they will not report it to the vendor, and it will remain unpatched for some criminal potentially to find as well and yeah. exploit other users if they find it. And I think the only way we're going to get a definition of how this was going to work is if for some reason a uh, vulnerability is sold to a company, that company sits on that information or sells it to another foreign government, let's say, that foreign government then uses it to attack a company, 
The company, through the process of legal discovery, determines that or discovers that the, an exploit was used against them, and it came from this other company inside the United States. And then we'll have a court decision that will help to define how this works. Yeah. Well, one thing I read in the article that I do think is interesting is now that vendors are paying, it said that the one benefit of that is that it is helping in some of these situations. You know, like let's say we're friends, you know, in college, and you discover this vulnerability, and I'm like, hey man, we should report that to Google, big payout. And I'm like, no man, I'm going to report it here for a lot more money. They're saying in some of these cases that the, the friend goes, well, no, 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 I'm not cool with that. They report it, they get the payout from Google, and it stops it, and it tracks it, you know, ends any opportunity for you to sell it. And then you lose a friend. As well. And then you lose a friend as well, <laughs> yeah. But it is, I mean, that is one benefit. I mean, I think um, the vendors do need to keep up with this. And if they can up the ante, up the ante, you know, because I think they are in a battle here. Uh, there's a market, and there's a market that will pay more. And, uh, you know, I think, my general opinion, this is just an you know, opinion, I think most people want to do good. And when there's a legal, legitimate way to earn, you'll do it. You know, if you think about music before iTunes came along, you know, people were just downloading because they needed the music in that format. When iTunes came along, it's like, I'll give 99 cents for that song. I think people want to do the right thing when it's clear cut. So, um, I, I don't know about that. You don't agree? <laughs> I, I don't know about you don't, that. You don't think are motivated matters? by money, I think, in this particular economy and, and you know, whoever pays the highest. Well, yeah, why do security researchers look for vulnerabilities? I mean, that's the question. And, well, and, and, and there's a lot of different reasons. Yeah. I mean, so some of them is just be, because it's fun. I mean, for some yeah. of them, they enjoy it. But it's time consuming. But it's, it's time consuming. Get paid off for that time. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Right. And, that. and there's always been the credit, though, too, the reputation. I mean, again, vendors up to credit, a few years ago. Credit or works not. for a while until the bill comes in the mail. Right. right. But, but security researchers have, most of them have a full time day job that they're doing. You can say that. You can say that. So I don't know that they're going to If you're asking that. somebody who's sitting in his, in his house and basement, wherever we were, he's comfortable working. <laughs> a coffee shop, wherever. And in doing a job he really likes, and do you think he's working for a corporate monster? <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. Probably not. Maybe if not. he can go make, you know, sell an exploit uh, every few months enough to, to live lavishly or even just pay the bills, I well, think he would not actually work for the corporate <laughs> guy. And given that situation, and I had less ethical quandaries about this. I'd probably do that. I'm not very good at, at that sort of line of work. Well, I just believe if there's a, a legitimate, good, respectable way to earn money from these exploits, that that will draw a large number of them. It won't draw them all, but I think ethically, when it's clear it's so that, how you define that? Why? Well, is that can't do right for the vendor? Well, I think I think what I think if 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 Google and Boopin, for example, paid the same amount of money, it'd be easy. You probably report it to Google. <laughs> would you not? You probably would. I mean, however, Boopin will just raise its rate. That's true. That's true. They have the government behind them. That's right. So well, the thing is, because it's, it's worth more to keep it quiet, so you can mm -hmm. give it to yeah. the government than it is to make it public. And give it to the vendor. Well, the problem is defining what the value is worth. It's come on, you know, how do you define Dollars. commodity? And what's it worth? But what's it worth to the market? market? If I if I market, found a dude. bug, if I found a bug and it took me ten hours to discover it, and Google said I'll give you a hundred thousand for it, I'm thinking that's a big payday. Even if Google yeah, gives you five, huge, it's a huge payday for ten hours and, effort. And, and how greedy do we have to be? And you know, Boopin's charging a hundred thousand dollars just to look, to look at, at their catalog, and governments are paying it. <laughs> just to look, just to browse. All right, and we're back again after another network connection failure. So we're going to wrap it up. Um, luckily, Keith and Mike didn't start punching each other. But, um, <laughs> Not yet. You can, you, you can follow the Serious Most Curious podcast on Twitter. We have a YouTube, and these are our individual uh, Twitter accounts if you want to follow us. Um, thanks to Mike Hill and Keith Watson, I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.